right. Well, thank you all for being here today. And I want to thank Dr. Susan Poser for joining us. Uh, and this has been a wonderful week to celebrate her inauguration. So I'm Renee McLeod Sorgen. I'm the Vice Dean and Professor of the Hofstra Northwell School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies and also the Director of the Division of Medical Ethics at Northwell Health. And it is my pleasure to share some work that we did during last year uh, with Dr. Walter Markowitz and Dr. Janet Dolgen. Dr. Walter Markowitz, who I'll bring up shortly, is the Assistant Professor with the MHA Program in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. And he teaches many of the policy classes with the School of Nursing with another one of our friends here, former Senator Kemp Hannon. He's been a team member on doing many grant writing, including our latest grant um, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he's co-authored several articles on the values and foundations for a healthcare system, an ethical healthcare system. And formerly for about 30 years, he worked as a corporate administrator and strategic planner for Northwell Health. So I'm gonna begin now um, and take you on a journey. This is our family nurse practitioner graduate of the Hofstra class of 2020, Jessica Mangeli. That class graduated a month early to join the front line to care for COVID patients. When she gave her speech at our convocation, you can see the balloons that were behind her from the hospital. You could see her in her hospital garb. And this is a direct quote from her. We want to reminisce on the journey we've been through at Hofstra University to obtain our graduate degree. You'll see her later, as well as our faculty and other students, and join in their journey. So we want to thank all of the frontline workers, not only the healthcare workers, but us here at Hofstra, as the teachers and educators, from the DoorDash workers, for everyone that kept us going along through all of this. And whether working on the front lines or helping keep hospitals and care facilities afloat, as Michael Dowling says, thank you to all our heroes. And with that, I'd like to show you something. We want to take you back and see what it was like to be on this journey. for a second so I can make sure I'm not blocking the camera. Well, we need so we can stay awake when we go to work, right? Otherwise we're tired. Gonna shut everything off and go to bed. A lot of people got sick. A lot of people are doing worse. I'm trying to calm the, the knot in my stomach right now. All of this is so scary because it's not even bad yet. Like, it hasn't started yet. It's a really difficult situation. I really think that people need to see what we're going through. Once you see what we're seeing and what we're experiencing, it's hard to not feel anxious or upset because the cost of human life is too great. We'll see how this goes. I think you recognize Jessica again there as well as you recognized her son that was born when she started this program. So this was really a life-changing journey, not only for our students, but also for society and the country. And with that, I'd like to bring up Dr. Walter Markowitz to really take us through the start. wanted to uh, thank Dr. McLeod for allowing me to be uh, part of this study. 
while I've been a health administrator for 30 plus years and ran emergency rooms and saw probably more than many ever should. This was one of the most moving experiences that I've ever had to be able to interview people who during the height of the pandemic were taking care of patients. Now let's see, how do I do this? Page down? Ah, okay. Um, Michael Dowling, who's the president. <laughs> Michael Dowling, who's the president and CEO of uh, Northwell Health, wrote a book that was called Leading Through the Pandemic. And um, I'd like to take you back through some of his words and through the words uh, of Dr. Smith, who's, who is the uh, medical director uh, for the uh, medical school. And while I tell students, don't put so many words on a page, I put this many words on a page because I think that the words are very important. So Michael said, the pandemic stands without doubt as the most frightening, overwhelming experience and of a, at, that any of us have been through, and the most humbling. We were stunned by the power of the virus and the disease it caused. Now this goes back to a year ago, beginning of March. And this is what uh, Dr. Larry Smith said, as he would make regular rounds through the hospital. In the hospital, it's very sad, stressful environment, almost surreal. He had never been in a hospital where so many patients are on ventilators, completely sedated, completely paralyzed, not moving a muscle. This next line was something that I wanted to emphasize because it was something that we heard from the people that we interviewed. One of the real serious dilemmas that they had is that there were no relatives that you could speak to. There, was no, there were no loved ones where you could talk about past history or help in the process of getting consent. Not a visitor in the entire hospital. There were just bodies lying around, as he put it, bed to bed to bed, and the only noise in the room was the sound of the ventilators. Patients never spoke, they didn't move, and yet they're potential killers. Now remember, we call this the novel coronavirus. We didn't know an awful lot about it. We didn't even really have a good sense as to how it was spread. And there was a tremendous fear on the part of the staff who still came in every day to care for their patients. They never spoke, and yet they were potential killers of the staff because they were shedding virus, endless rows of body, but they didn't move, and there was nobody there to tell you about them, and it was terribly frightening. Now, you probably won't remember this, but somewhere in the early 2020s, toward the end of February, we were experiencing one of the worst flu epidemics. And hospitals were trying to gear up at that time for dealing with that flu epidemic. And then came this lovely new uh, virus called the coronavirus. And we saw the first positive case in New York on Mar March 1st. And back then it was said, well, there really is no reason for undue anxiety. Yeah, there were some cases in some other countries but the likelihood is, is that the risk for here in New York is very low. And then we started to hear language like this. We started to hear that this is an invisible, ruthless killer driving vast numbers of people into hospitals around the world. New York City became the epicenter. And quite frankly, we were unprepared. And there are many who believe that we're still unprepared and we're seeing how unprepared the rest of the country is in trying to deal with this disease. Nurses and physicians face invading deadly virus burdens, had emotional uh, struggles, trying to deal with uh, their professional duty, and at the same time, so fearful for both themselves and also for their families. Um, I still remember my son who described how he would come home and before he would enter the house, he would take off all of his clothing and just walk into the shower before he would even say hello to the rest of his family. That's how fearful he was of, of uh, spreading the disease to them. A little bit about what happened in March. March 16th. 
the governor issued um, an approval for hospitals to increase their capacity. And there was actually an attempt to try and increase the capacity by 100%. And again, at a time when the flu epidemic was already with us. The goal was to increase the number of beds by uh, 9,000. And while we didn't achieve that, I'm not sure that we, that we really had to at the time, and we had some other resources, and I'll get to that in just a second. Governor said our main priority is to reduce the rate of spread. And then we heard this. We never fought a virus like this with this type of potential consequences. And again, um, he gave the approval for hospitals to increase their capacity. Uh, Dr. McLeod, do you want to tell us how, wh where we actually ended up putting beds? <laughs> every recovery room, every ambulatory care site. We, we closed down a good number of our ambulatory care sites entirely and brought the clinical staff in to go care for our patients in the hospital. I'm not going as fast as I'm talking. Just to give you a, a sense of how fast this actually came, came to us here in uh, New York State. On March 4th, we, we had six cases. Five days later, we only have 14 cases. And then take a look at what happened by March 23rd. We went up to 20,000 cases. And then a week later, we had a cumulative number of cases of 6,600 and then doubled that in the next week. And then we kept on going up by 60,000 for the next few weeks. It was really an incredibly frightening time for everyone here in New York. A little bit about mortality. Again, these are cumulative cases. March 4th, it was 6 and 14. And then look at what happened to the numbers. So we saw by April, t April 20th, we had a quarter of a million deaths just here in New York State. This will give you, again, another sense of, sorry, why am I, oh, I didn't move my page, I'm sorry, my fault. This will give you a sense as to number of hospitalizations that we saw and the uh, tremendous increase in those, uh, in the hospitalizations and in um, ICU use. Again, this will give you one more sense about here in New York City and the Long Island region, um, how many cases we actually had. And you see that the numbers become quite staggering. You may also remember, uh, back on March 30th, uh, we, uh, the U.S. Navy brought in the, the USNS uh, Comfort, which had 1,000 beds. And then over in the Javits Center, the Army created another 2,500 beds for us. And, and fortunately, while we had this, this tremendous, tremendous spike, we also had an ability to handle those patients as the numbers of patients started to go down precipitously as well. But at the time, we didn't know that that was actually going to happen. And we're really fearful that we were going to be uh, tremendously overwhelmed. Dr. McLeod, I think this is yours. Thank you. So I hope that Dr. Markowitz has painted the picture and you've seen the picture of what our students were living through as they had a dual interest to society, caring for patients as nurses, as well as becoming educated. Well, during this time when we're seeing this meteoric rise, ethicists all over the country were looking at protocols and guidelines that we call crisis care standards. You'll recall that the flu was what we had made major of these algorithms for. And so we were looking at the algorithms of the flu for how do we prepare for pandemics and epidemics, except COVID did not behave like the flu. On March 24th, 
how will doctors allocate these scarce medical resources during the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic? As we all now now looking back and where we were at the end of March 30th, we were worried about was there going to be a ventilator for every patient that needed it? Was there going to be appropriate dialysis for every patient that needed it? And so frontline workers were faced every day with the fear that the next patient that came in might not have the resources. This is where this paper, this qualitative mixed method quantitative qualitative study takes place. Looking at the 30 days between March 30th and April 30th, when we had the most surge, when we were most worried about our patients not having resources. I've shown you before a clip of what it was like for the students. I'd like you to see one of our panelists, who's also adjunct professor, what it was like for her being a professor and then also being a frontline worker. This is Dr. Elise Asoko. Thank you. 
tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. So I'm gonna take a deep breath and keep going on. I think I just needed that a little let down. But now I'm gonna continue on and power on through back into the end. So stay strong. to finally change my scrubs and hopefully go home. Today is day five of a 13 hour shift week. I usually do three days a week. I'm up to five 13 hour shifts this week and I'm tired. So I'm about to change my scrubs to head home to see my babies. So you saw a day in a life, and with that, I'd like to bring up the panel. We are so pleased to be joined by Dr. Jerome Weiner, who is a critical care pulmonologist, a medical ethicist, and an assistant professor at the Zucker Hofstra School of Medicine. We have Dr. Mary Lemp, who is the program director for the family nurse practitioner, medical ethicist, as well as being the program director and assistant professor here at the School of Nursing. And you met Dr. Elise Asopo. So we're gonna have a panel and really ask them some poignant questions. And I also want you to know that while you watch that day in the life with Elise, and you saw the night nurse, Danielle DiBardino, come in from IR. She was also a Hofstra Northwell nursing student that in addition to working nights and days, was taking classes here at Hofstra. So thank you to the panel. I'm gonna start off by asking you the first question. If you can really talk about how this experience personally affected you, and what it brought to you as clinicians, as educators, and as ethicists. Elise? Absolutely. Um, thank you everyone for being here. So I've been a nurse and nurse practitioner for over 20 years. Um, and obviously, like everybody says, this pandemic was like nothing we've ever seen before. But talking about ethics, um, I've always did risk stratification with patients and families and talked about what will work, what won't work, what we recommend, but never had to make that decision myself. And being on this committee and having these to decide who gets a ventilator, who doesn't, working with clinicians all over the hospital to decide if we have to allocate resources, who benefits and who doesn't, was probably the worst thing I've ever had to do in my life. Um, when I was reviewing for today, just thinking back, I didn't have to write anything down because it's just what the reality was. And I remember one patient specifically um, before the committee, the ethics committee helped us decide uh, how to have objective and subjective data to make deci these decisions. We didn't have that at the beginning of the pandemic. And looking back, that helped us significantly. So we looked at a patient and I could say, this patient is never gonna come off the ventilator, but when you have to actually tell them they're not gonna get a ventilator, it's a totally different experience. I kept thinking to myself, I'm, I'm not God to make that decision. Even though I know 20 years of doing this, that they're never gonna come off it, I don't wanna be the one to make that decision. So the one thing that came out of this was for the future to have these from the committee, the ethics committee that helped us tremendously to have this subjective data to say, 
I have data to know that this patient won't be able to come off the ventilator, and I can tell you that objectively without just being subjective of my clinical knowledge. Thank you. Dr. Lena? Well, uh, you started out by asking how has this affected uh, um, us. Um, I've been a critical care physician for almost 40 years. Uh, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in the unit with very uh, critically ill patients. Um, it was a whole other experience um, being in a situation where uh, we were somewhat fearful of our own safety, but also taking care of a uh, new, new disease uh, for which we knew we did not have specific treatment. And that's, I think, what was the most difficult for me, uh, taking care of patients on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. Um, we did all sorts of interventions, uh, some sophisticated, some not, uh, but at the time, certainly in late March and early April, there was nothing that we knew uh, was going to have a, a definite effect. And that's very, very difficult for us as clinicians to go to the bedside and know that uh, there's no known treatment. In fact, in the same, in the same uh, vein, the usual things that we would do to take care of a patient with breathing failure, renal failure, and such, we might not be able to do. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, a function of not having a ventilator. It was because we were worried about transmission and such. We could not afford the patient the usual um, treatments to help them through respiratory failure. And that was also very, very difficult. And uh, I, I had not seen Dr. Larry Smith's uh, um, quote, um, but uh, that, uh, that was very, very effective. I uh, also uh, was involved in uh, a uh, critical critical care unit that was converted into a COVID unit. It was the uh, cardiac ICU at uh, South Shore University Hospital. We had 20 patients, all of them intubated, all of them sedated, all of them paralyzed, no family, and it was truly, uh, um, uh, Dr. Smith used the word frightening. Uh, I had used the word Hellish. It was a very uncomfortable situation. Um, so uh, it was uh, difficult to uh, continue to take care of patients, but we knew we must. We also knew we were more pressed to assess whether someone might benefit from the addition of this critical care. And uh, um, you know, it's something that, as, as an ethicist, we are frequently asked to assist families and staff to help a patient, uh, or a patient uh, and the staff and the, and the clinicians decide whether or not to go further, whether or not to continue care. And this is, this is exactly what we uh, uh, were faced with uh, to, uh, uh, to continue caring for the, for the patients and their families. Uh, it was exceptionally hard because everything was over the phone. There was no one at the bedside. We would know nothing about a particular patient when they were in the ICU. Um, it was a little different for people uh, working elsewhere in the hospital. Uh, uh, in as difficult as, what, as it was, I, had, I was working at a very contained uh, place uh, as you were working. Um, in the emergency room, people were being brought in moment to moment, critically ill people, uh, uh, again with no family. And decisions had to be made sometimes fairly quickly about whether they would be uh, offered um, uh, supportive care. Uh, 
people were admitted to the hospital, they were placed on oxygen, they'd be there for a couple of days, they would deteriorate. And the uh, physicians caring for the patients on the floor would be very, very hard pressed because they would see patients, they would hope that patients wouldn't deteriorate and they would in front of them sometimes quickly and they would have to make decisions about whether advanced care might be useful. This was a wholly different stressful situation that I know I didn't go through, but I, I spent a few nights covering in the hospital and you heard the loudspeaker go on every 20 minutes that they were calling for assistance. And it's something that never, never happened in, a, in an institution before with all the patients continuing to uh, deteriorate. Dr. Lim. So I'm gonna speak from the perspective of uh, being part of the ethics panel as opposed to um, being actually in the front lines because in fact I was not, even though I am a clinician. So I can bring the perspective of our students who are working nurses and who were all redeployed during the pandemic, during those days in um, starting middle of March. And what they came to into our classrooms with on Zoom uh, with the perspective of being the last person to see a patient you know, in their last moments of life as opposed to having no family around, not being able to, you know, say that their last words, like I love you, to the one person that they needed to speak to. And I'm sorry, I'm usually not emotional at all. <laughs> um, in terms of, the per of, of perspective for me, um, I found that it was unusually emotional, very difficult to actually um, deal with helping make these decisions and being involved in it, um, surprisingly, I think, and that it was something that um, I have learned a lot from, both personally, and I've learned a lot about the resilience of our students, of our colleagues, and um, of our families, the patient, our mm -hmm. patients and our families, how resilient people really will be when they have to be and how with support and with um, collegiality I'm going to say and to know that um, you are valued and respected and loved that I think people can um, get through almost anything. Thank you for that Dr. Lip. I think this next question is in line what you talked about um, at least in early March or April, we were worried about ventilators, but that didn't happen. So how did your role in these hospital committee review teams really help to address the clinician moral distress about availability of this life-sustaining treatments and care that you talked about? Okay, so we're calling it the ethics committee, but that's really not correct. It was really a clinical, um, I'm going to call it a triage team, and that was uh, a group of people who were already identified prior to the, uh, or at the beginning of the pandemic, who um, could be on call to answer questions from a clinical team about the prognosis and, you know, how we we're, we're going to direct the care for a particular individual patient. And um, we were all on call, and we could be called at any time, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, um, three o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it may be. The only criteria was that we had to have three people. So this was never a decision that we were helping a team make one person. It was always a quorum of three. Those three people could have been all clinicians, could have been all ethicists, could have been a combination of uh, any of those uh, things. And uh, what we dealt with in the early days were, were really panic because we were being called in the middle of an emergency and because the team just didn't know where to go. 
And um, I, I think that's not the time for us to be called. I think if, in hindsight, that it would be better if there could be some sort of communication prior when you identify, wow, this, this, it doesn't look like this is going in the direction that we want. Let me call in this team to help make a decision that is going to be the best decision for the patient and the caregivers. Thank you. Dr. Sopo, as Dr. Lemp alluded to, this review team that was called specifically was to attempt to balance the concern of prognosis and maximizing prognosis with concerns about social justice that we've heard during this week. Specifically, unconscious bias, discrimination, social determinants of health. How did the participants, how did this trio really review and balance that? So what I liked about um, the team is we weren't the bedside clinician by the bedside. So we were looking from an outside perspective. Um, the only information that we got on the patient was the story that the clinician by the bedside would tell us as well as the data that we would need to make the decision, uh, an appropriate medical decision or allocation of resources or what would be best for the patient. Their age, so age was one of the things that could be a determinant that would be biased, but age didn't matter in the whole scheme of things because you could have been a 20 year old with metastatic cancer or a 90 year old with maybe just no comorbidities and the allocation of resources would have gone to the 90 year old Whereas any of us sitting here would be like, well, the 20 year old had, um, you know, has more of a life and has a more, but it, it, uh, in a clinical realm, it, that is not the case. So the unconscious bias wasn't there and we couldn't put our sense in because we had, were able to use, as you pointed out, the SOFA score and putting in real data. And the data that we put in was actually age, medical history, which we talked about the medical history, but lab values that actually speak for themselves and tell, give us a, a score to tell us, would this patient be able to come out of the ICU, come off a ventilator? So we were really using real good subjective da data, I'm sorry, objective data to make these decisions. Thank you. Dr. Weiner. Um, even in hearing this, and I, I lived through it, that public perception of what Dr. Osopo said, that somehow older age would matter, or as we've seen with nursing home patients or disabled patients, that they might not receive fairness. How did you deal with that public perception when you didn't have the families there? How was that? Well, I guess um, the best answer is that we, we didn't have to deal with a public perception when we were making a decision about a particular patient. So uh, when we were trying to de develop the, the criteria, we spent a lot of time talking about the potential biases, including ageism, that might come to play. But ultimately, um, you know, every physician and nurse taking care of patients in the institution weren't aware, uh, weren't dealing with the overall use of vent or allocation of ventilators in the hospital. Uh, it was a the the theoretical issue, but we were always dealing with the individual patient. So when it came to an evaluation, we tried to make it ad as objective as we could possibly make it. And even, even with objective data, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of range in what the outcomes might be. But we tried to do our best to, to evaluate whether an individual patient would benefit from that type of care. And that was probably the, the only way to deal with uh, to be able to do it fairly. Uh, and we weren't uh, doing it with an audience, uh, although sometimes uh, the family might not feel that it was uh, 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 ap appropriate or not, but we had to do our best to support the clinicians um, uh, at the bedside to make as um, fair 
and rational evaluation about the chance for improvement uh, by institution of critical care. So Dr. Lim, you guys have talked about ageism and how you try to equalize ageism. How did you prevent other threats to ethical principles that are utilize, usually utilized in medicine? So uh, some of those ethical principles, uh, certainly one of them is autonomy. Um, and what we tried to get ahead of time was to know what the wishes of the patient were, to know what the wishes of the family were, but to also tr uh, incorporate that into um, the decision that we were helping the team make. And we blinded, we were blinded to other kinds of things, uh, biases, like we had no idea what the ethnicity was. We had no idea if they had insurance or didn't have insurance. So those kinds of things were never, um, never an issue. Uh, we just knew that we had a pay, and, and we also didn't know if they had COVID. That had nothing to do with it. It didn't make a difference if they were, uh, if they were um, diagnosed with uh, COVID. Um, it could have been any reason that they needed uh, a resources for critical care. Thank you. So Dr. Sopo, you've really, we've seen a little bit about what you talked about, that fatigue, um, the fatigue that you had as a provider, the fatigue that you obviously had to have to respond to these teams on the nights when you weren't a provider. How did you, in any of those roles, engage the trust of family members? What were some of the communication strategies with family members you saw utilized? Absolutely. So there was a lot of things that we did um, that I am happy to talk about um, because I think an important part of any patient or any family is knowing the patient. So in our units, it started in one unit and then we would actually implement it into all other units is getting pictures, um, posting on a wall. Our social workers would actually call the family and we would make a sign of their, their family and their favorite pet and things that they, what did I like? And it actually helped me as a clinician be able to, as I'm putting a central line in or an arterial line or running a code, talk to the patient, tell them, you know, talk about the name their dog. So they actually had felt like somebody was there. There's one patient, I'll ne there's many patients I'll never forget, but one patient I'll never forget, you know, families towards the end were able to be there when they were dying, but at the beginning, we no families were there. And I, it was a um, Korean speaking woman and she only spoke Korean and he, the son had told me, she loves Korean music, and I promised him that I would never leave her bedside until she passed and she wouldn't pass alone. Um, so we put music on in the background for this lady who's Korean, man, but we put, we know their music type that they like. We put music on in the background and hold their hands. Um, we also utilized iPads, which were a, save, a savior. Um, so we would have, be able to set up family meetings and have iPad conversations. And sometimes we just leave the iPad by the bedside and let the family talk to the, the patient so they could hear their, their voice. Uh, there was one family member, and, and not to talk about religion or race or anything, but they were um, uh, Greek Orthodox, and it was Greek Easter, and uh, they said all he needs, he needs to have holy water put on his head. And now, I am Jewish, and I will say, it was the first time I used holy water, but I came on on Greek <laughs> Easter, and they taught me how to use holy water, and I put holy water on the man's head, and he actually passed away two days later, and they actually reached out to me via social media. They found me on social media to say that they will never forget what I did for their family member, knowing that he passed, having had um, communion. Uh, so these are the things we just tried to bond with the patients and families. And the most important thing that I wanted to talk about is trust and building trust and relationships with people. And um, I have a lot of families that still reach out and I'm still friendly with during that whole pandemic that in 20 years, I haven't had made this many friends with family, even when they were by the bedside. I have so many, built so many relationships because they weren't there and they knew we were. So we had to build that relationship and that trust from afar away. Thank you. So Dr. Weiner, did you ever feel a conflict between caring for the individual patients when you were doing so in the critical care? versus in the back of your mind, knowing that there were so many more potential 
patients that might need that same care? No. Um, that's uh, that's uh, that's an important question. I, I I as I had mentioned before, when with care when we have a patient in our in our care that we are responsible for participating in the care for, we are responsible to them and them alone. And the in terms of being a clinician. Um, we are responsible to that patient to do the right thing, to do the moral thing, to do the to treat them the way we would treat any other patient. And if I found myself withdrawing care because I think somebody else needs it down the line, I'm not fulfilling my obligation to my patient at the bedside. And this actually is where we. I think at, in the clinical review teams were, were supportive to, the peop to everybody else in the hospital that were dealing with the same things. Those physicians needed support for their patient, whether it was to advanced care or whether it was to determine that a care wasn't appropriate. But we were very helpful for supporting their efforts of doing the right thing for their individual patient. Okay. Sounds like something very important that you guys serve to deal with moral distress. The final two questions I'm gonna to ask to both of you. This presentation is talking about March 2020 to April 2020. It's hard to believe, but we're a year and a half down the line. So Dr. Lemp, you first. What would your current self tell yourself in March 2020 to prepare you for your role in the hospital clinical review team, as well as your role with patients and students and your colleagues? I think uh, hindsight is 2020, right? So I think that um, one of the things I said earlier is that I think it would have been very helpful to maybe have anticipated that this clinical review team was going to be formed, which we did, and rather than just throw us into it, um, to kind of have a meeting of the minds be ahead of time to know what the goals are, like what was our, our actual role, how were we meant to help these uh, primary teams take care of these patients and, and help them come to a decision, because at the end of the day, it's not the decision of the clinical review team who was really providing information and support, right? It's really gonna be the decision of the, um, the primary team who has to live with that decision. Dr. Sofa, same question. Yep. So uh, I have a similar response, but the one line I always tell my students and my children um, is it's always better to be proactive than reactive. And obviously we didn't know that the pandemic was going to hit or happen, um, so we had to be reactive. So now that we do know, being proactive is essential um, for the next pandemic or the next wave. And for families, by, and the, for the clinicians by the bedside, myself included, to have these discussions as a team with even the clinical review team beforehand, before the emergency happens. So when we get into the emergency, we're not floundering to say, well, what are we gonna do? Or what are we supposed to do? We already have decisions made. We already had conversations with families. And I think that's my takeaway from this. Dr. Weiner. Um, I think uh, the one of the smart things that the uh, health system did uh, from the very beginning uh, was to provide sufficient support um, um, so the staff felt, uh, or at least they minimized the sense that the staff was out there by, on the, by themselves. They brought in people from offices, they brought in people from ambulatory units, as you heard. Um, they uh, made certain that the staff at, on, the, on the front line were supported 
and given uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, moral support, and I think the clinical review teams were part of that, mm -hmm. and that was very effective. Um, the camaraderie that occurred in the hospital uh, during this time was wonderful, and frankly, I hadn't seen it in my institution in, in years. <laughs> Uh, and, but I, I know we weren't the only uh, we weren't the only institution. So, the uh, the, the proactive the, the lessons learned uh, I think is that the support of the staff uh, worked, and it's essential. And that should be that was perhaps more important than getting us more ventilators. Thank you. Can I put in two cents? Yes, please, Dr. Clark. I have a quote from uh, Mr. Dowling about what you just said. In the book, he writes, in order to care for patients, the top priority must be protecting the health and safety of staff. And, and I know that on a very regular basis, he had all of the senior staff uh, of the system make rounds on, on a regular basis to try and give as much support as they, as they possibly could. And uh, that was a major priority of, of what they thought was incredibly important. And again, kind of nice to hear that you actually felt that. And so our final question, um, which you alluded to, Dr. Weiner, Dr. Sopo, what lessons learned from your experience would you give to current frontline workers with escalating COVID patients now? So we're still dealing with COVID patients. Um, we still have a separate COVID ICU um, and COVID patients in, throughout the whole health system. Um, I would say, like I said before, being proactive and having these conversations early on so we don't have to wait until the time when things are, resources are not there or the patient is not doing well and every, the family is not ready for these conversations. Just a slow progression since we have the time now. Dr. Lip? I would say that uh, people should be kind to themselves and to, um, remember to uh, care for themselves and put their, um, their emotional and uh, uh, mental health uh, as a priority. And Dr. Weiner. I don't think I can improve on what Dr. Lemke yeah, said. <laughs> <laughs> and on that, we're gonna thank you guys all for your participation. <laughs> um, and Dr. Markowitz, you're up next. I can speak from here. Uh, Let me go a little bit about lessons learned for just a couple minutes. I think minutes. we have a slide set. Okay. <laughs> gonna, so guys, you could take see your where seats. We are. The screen is going to come down. <laughs> okay. And there will be time for questions, I promise. Let down, Mr. You let down the screen, please. Thank you. Hang here with me. I will. Thank you very much. We can do this together. Because you have some pieces of this that you like also. No, we make a different thing. Yeah. If you haven't guessed, we've become friends over the years. Yeah, I don't think COVID broke that up. <laughs> yeah, let's try. <laughs> it's a fashion sense, Dr. Uh, Lemp. <laughs> uh, I'm reminded of something that uh, Dr. Gallo said during the uh, last graduation ceremony, and, and she told the group she started with, you're a very extraordinary group. You, in fact, were able to excel during your, your academic year, and at the same time, virtually all of you were also taking care of COVID patients during this time. And uh, it's, it's something that I, I keep on remembering in the back of my mind. Um, so you know what I think is, is very interesting is that what's on the screen right now are the four things that Janet, Walter, and I found. And you'll see the word hellish. <laughs> you'll see the word that there was a lot of tension with the constant need for life and death medical sense theme. The third theme, that support was very big, and the fourth, that lack of preparation for handling the demands of the pandemic 
increased clinician and ethicist moral distress. This has actually been about a year yes. since we did these initial um, interviews. And you saw these interviews now, and I think the fifth theme, if we had to add it, would be resilience yes, absolutely. and proactive ethics. And I, I really want to thank the support of both Hofstra and Northwell, because when Sam Packer started this little division of medical ethics, with one ethicist, of which I was one of the first nurse practitioners that was an ethics fellow. Um, we were running around, and there was one of us for five hospitals. Through the decade of support, we had actually funded 118 people to come to the School of Law and take the Hofstra Bioethics Certificate course. Those 118 people volunteered their time for these clinical review teams. Yeah. That would not have been possible without the academic structure. And I almost tear up about that. I, I, I was thinking, I, I had done a, a presentation to the uh, ethics team uh, a few months back, and we went through quite a number of the statements that were made during our interviews. And, and, and one, of, one of the directors of one of the hospitals said, I almost broke down crying while you were speaking because it, it, it just brought back su such raw emotions um, from what they all went through. So your lessons learned. My lessons learned. Moral distress and ad anxiety were produced by increased responsibility for decision making about continuation or not of life sustaining care. I, I, I was taken by what Dr. Weiner said before about taking care of, of the individual patients. And then he said something before that about the incredible overload of patients that were coming into the emergency room at the same time. And, and I know that he knows that w one of his roles as ER, this is pre-pandemic, one of the roles that we used to ask him to play uh, regarding the ICU is how many of your patients can step down so that we can bring more ER patients into your OR? And so as, as you were saying, yes, I have a finite number of patients that I could take care of. I kept on thinking about that overload of patients that are coming into the emergency room that are so critically ill also. And, and how is it, you know, that, that to me is where a lot of the, the moral distress comes from. Um, there was a panic. There was a real panic about trying to make triage decisions about whether or not you were going to have to sacrifice someone's life for others. And while we didn't get into this, we'll call it triage situation here at Northwell, think about what we started to hear recently in other states in the country that are now talking about rationing care and about how uh, withdrawing care from people so that they can care for, for others. And, and, and again, fortunately, we, we never got to that situation at all. It was an incredible burden on, on clinicians. We didn't really know how to care for patients. We didn't know what was going to work. We didn't know what wasn't going to work. The, the, the scientists were trying to tell us, no, oh, no, we need control group. And meanwhile, you had your patient in front of you, and you were trying anything that you possibly could in order to care for them. And as I says, we just, we just didn't have to go through that. And thankfully, we never did. But our question is, what if it was? I think some mm -hmm. of the things that you know we learned during this time, and so much was going on at this time, I was lucky to work with Nancy Berlinger with the Empire State Bioethics Consortium during this time. And just as we were about to close, uh, she came up with these guidelines for institutional ethics services to respond to COVID-19. You know, public health usually promotes the health of the population by minimizing mortality. But significant moral distress exists when clinicians recognize that even though caring for patients is tantamount, the uncertainty of not having enough resources, the uncertainty of the next surge is lingering. So what do we do? We have to adhere to disaster-based protocol that may require giving or withholding treatment over the objections of patients. 
We use the clinical review team to make sure that we could have transparent conversations with patients. So the clinical review team were helping the clinicians with the distress, but at the same time, social workers and other members of those teams were deployed to work with family. But we've lived through this, but we haven't lived beyond it. So one of the things that we were happy to say is that with our lessons learned, that we need to apply what we did well here in New York to other countries. And that means shift. Walter said this already. Right, I just said it. Um, you know, top priority is protecting the health and safety of staff. So that meant we had to shift from inpatient hospitalization to mass mandates. And now we're shifting from mass mandates to vaccine mandates. But the social determinants of health, even though the clinical review teams did as much as they could to be unbiased, we really transitioned during this period of time to moral determinants of health. There's a devastating toll of COVID-19, and by race and ethnicity, as we've heard you know, in other talks during this week, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans were more likely to be hospitalized, much more likely to die. And so definitely, even past our primary surge and the secondary surge, this article came out in August of 2020 that says it will take people of color almost 50 years or two generations to recover from the structural inequalities that the pandemic not only raised, but continued and amplified. I just, want to just give adding to, to the distrust that we're suddenly, that we're still seeing. That we're still seeing right along in the communities that surround us here in Uniondale and Hempstead. It's not all horrible news. Black and Hispanics also drove down the virus infection rate. This was in September of 2020, where many got vaccinated, definitely got tested, and definitely a public health victory was in trying to mobilize in Long Island's minority communities. So as Dr. Markowitz and I kind of leave you, we're hoping to leave you with more questions as you've gone through this journey. Are we better prepared now if there's another pandemic surge? And what could, or better yet, what should we do differently? And as you've heard this talk, what other things are you going to walk away from this talk and think and bring to the academic environment, but to the real world environment, and also to our students? And so once again, thank you for letting us be here. And we've all had our vaccinations. We hope to the three, public three, that's like, three, now three, you're I at three. three. <laughs> we hope to the public that you also <laughs> will get vaccinated as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so please, if you have any questions for ourselves or the panelists, the mic is there. Uh oh. So um, thank you very much. This was an incredibly interesting, informative, and moving uh, presentation. And I'm, I, I'm sorry that it happened uh, towards the end of the week. Um, it's my ninth um, <laughs> symposium I've been to, um, but not everybody um, was able to be here. And so I'm, I'm sorry about that. And I, I hope that people will be able to see the recording of it. Um, my question is, um, you know, I, I, I think y you're asking all the right questions about the next pandemic or the next surge. My question is, was anything learned through this huge trauma, which again, we're still enduring, that teaches us something about care outside of a pandemic, just regular care, whether it's oncology or pediatrics or whatever, gerontology? Have there been lessons learned there that can be applied once we go back to sort of everyday <laughs> health care and get out of this? I'm glad you asked that, Dr. Poser. Well, one of the things is that palliative care, ethics, chaplaincy, social work, those are all the things in hospital systems that are usually seen as nice to have but don't have to have. 
I think some of the lessons that we learned is all of those communication strategies that we put here at the Zucker School of Medicine that exist at the Hofstra Northwell School of, of Nursing aren't nice to have, they're have to have. I think we've learned that these things, humanity and resilience, lives more in the, not in the machines that we use to keep people in alive, but the people who help to keep people alive and transition from life to death. And I hope that what we've learned is that the people are much more important than the technology. But I don't know what my panelists think. Putting on my, my very practical administrator hat, one of the things that we saw that became very crucial was maintenance of, of the supply chain coming into the hospital. And yes, we got really good with 3D printers and, and things such as that, but we also found that our reliance on other countries in order to manufacture things became an incredible detriment, an incredible thing that we had to get past. And um, it's something that with the system as large as Northwell, that they actually started to partner with manufacturers in order to do some of the manufacturing themselves. So you can get away. We, 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 we were trying to save money and help. One of the things that we did was what's called just-in-time inventory, and expecting that we were always going to get those supplies and equipment that we needed almost instantaneously. And when that didn't happen, we found that as an industry, we were in some tremendous trouble, and we really just have to change the, the way that we deal with supply chain. Well, Walter, is, that, is that fair? That's fair, but Dr. Yeah. Markowitz, I also love what you told me early on, uh, the story about us decreasing the number of beds that we had in the hospital. I think that was a real lesson that we also learned about where we decrease that maybe that strategically isn't the best thing for the next pandemic. Can you talk we, about that? Absolutely. We, I, have, I have heard for the last 20 years of my life that we, what we have to do is shrink the number of beds because they're just too costly and if you have beds, they're going to get filled unnecessarily. And at the same time, what we never really considered was that, yes, we're going to have pandemics, we're going to have flu, and that somehow or other we have to either set up our inpatient facilities in a way that we can swing beds from general care to intensive care, and or we have to keep staff sort of, of beds that are available in case of emergencies, either in, in for a particular county or for a particular region. And um, th this is something that we try to implement here in New York by, by regionalizing throughout the entire state and being able to move patients from, from one facility to another. But, but at the same time, the whole state was so overwhelmed that there were difficulties doing. Northwell was, was able to switch with, with the overload at LIJ and Forest Hills and send patients out to the South Side and to, and to Peconic Bay, for instance, and to Mather, I, I think mm -hmm. it was That's correct. correct. Yes. Um, but not every place had that, that type of capability. And, and if, in fact, as, as it turned out, our bed crunch was uh, different when I say our, I'm a Suffolk person, but it was difficult out in Suffolk County, I'm not sure where we would have sent them. And so somehow or other, we really do have to have some sort of, of cadre of, of inpatient resources or be able to quickly switch over some of our outpatient resources 
and to have better integration Absolutely. across health systems. Um, because we definitely saw that health in hospitals was very detrimentally affected. Um, so the collegiality among the hospitals also needs to improve. I think that's one of the biggest efforts. Rather than having cutthroat competition all the time. Correct. Did we answer your question? Couldn't see you smiling. <laughs> so one of the things that I heard a lot about was all of the building of trust, the relationships, the word resilience. So it almost seems like your clinical skills are necessary but not sufficient. That that interpersonal skill is is going to take you to that over the uh, the next level. So how do you? build that into your curriculum with training because your curriculum is typically focused on all the technical stuff so how do you build in that that compassion that empathy the way the need to communicate mm -hmm. thank you for that um i think it's a really great question and we always talk about the hidden curriculum being professionalism and ethics well i'm really proud here at hofstra it's not a hidden curriculum from day one whether you're in the medical school and you do EMT rounds, you learn three key words, tell me more. That's also thread through, through all of our health professions in the School of Nursing. And so the best skill that our students learn is to listen, to not assume, and to not be blinded by the things that could be biased. Um, so yes, I think building that in with simulation, standardized patients, um, and then building in, as Dr. Lemp said, self-care. We asked our students, or well, one question item that, of course, we know can't be validated because it's a one question item about burnout and exhaustion when they mm -hmm. were on Zoom. And we did a class about joy at work and pulling in everything from the National Academies. And we expected that what we were gonna hear were stories of horrible exhaustion they weren't at the point of burnout, which statistics are be significant. And we wondered why. And what we later learned is that they were in Zoom rooms having parties from their own homes, that they were sharing the victories. And so it's even now I found that video of Dr. Sopo a year and a half later, but to see one of our students smiling, though she worked at night, worked at day, and the next day had a Zoom class. That's empathy, but that's also joy at school, I call it. But maybe what made things so difficult in this particular pandemic is that we didn't have the family there. And oftentimes patients are present so quickly that you couldn't really communicate with them either. And as a result, clinical people just made everything so much harder. What you try to do as a clinician, you can do it in so many ways. What you try to do as a clinician is to actually create a, a partnership with your patient so that they have an understanding of, and you have a mutual understanding of, of a pathway of, of a direction for a care plan. And in that way, you just also get a lot more compliance. That, that couldn't be done in this particular case because of the circumstances. But I think it was, it was recreated in ways. The other thing I don't want us to leave away as we're coming to the closing of our hour with the fact that the hospital clinical review teams were the only teams that were going around to communicate with families. Mm -hmm. And I think as Dr. Lemp said, and she really clarified, this wasn't the ethics committee, this wasn't the ethics consult service, this wasn't the palliative service, all of those things that normally take place in a hospital still went on. This was another group of people on top of that to help for the moral distress and to help with empathy and to give people more time so that they could have those communication conversations. So we're coming to the close of our hour. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all of us who watch us later, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Right on time.